yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Madeline Betts, um, offspring of Kendra, <laughs> and um, I am based in Denver. I have my ATP and working for Action Seating and Mobility. They are a supplier based in the Oklahoma, Arkansas, and we have um, one location in Denver. Um, I am a graduate at the University of Pittsburgh um, Master's in Rehabilitation Technology Program. Um, so that was a really great experience, set me up to get my ATP, and you know my background is kind of more in the clinical um, realm of things, but I'm not a clinician, so excited to be here. And I'm Kendra Betts. Um, I am a physical therapist. I've spent my entire career, happy to report I'm in my first job 30 years later. Um, love working, uh, taking care of our veterans. Um, also serve as adjunct faculty for the University of Pittsburgh. And I always talk about ISS on the advisory committee for ISS. And I'm great to see a nice turnout for our event. And um, we're excited to share some good information with you. Yes, my mic is on, right? Yeah, it is. They don't want my mic any louder than that. All right. <laughs> So a couple disclosures, we have no financial interest um, to disclose. And as always, um, love to share a lot of videos and pictures and testimonials. And we're not endorsing or critiquing any company. I can't do that on behalf of the federal government or universities, but you will see a lot of products represented. And um, just really like to thank all the folks that we've learned a lot from along the way. So we'll jump right in. When we look at um, our objectives for the, for the course, it always, I love my, the picture's always strategic to keep us on target. We hope that you walk away with understanding the professional skills that you use every day that are directly applicable to adaptive sports and recreation. To look at several technology innovations that I think you will not have been previously aware of for supporting um, individuals with complex impairments. I'd like you to be aware of what's available for folks who use power wheelchairs. We'll go through some examples and really gain an understanding of what's available to the population of folks who are typically less mobile or have more significant impairments. Um, to think about the critical considerations when we're providing seating interventions in adaptive sports, why that's so important, just as it is for wheeled mobility applications, and then to look for resources for more information so that you guys can go out there, carry on next week in the clinic, be thinking about how we're going to support um, our athletes and their adaptive sports participation. So with that, I'll hand it over to Maddie. Yeah, so we always like to talk about, you know, we love adaptive sports. We've been doing it for a long time. And there's a lot of options out there. You know, you're a T10 para, choose your sport. Cycling, basketball, rugby for, you know, higher level injuries. So, you know, there's always options out there for a lot of people. And we kind of wanted to dive in and look at more complex options for more complex individuals. Yeah. Make a sport. We've, you've seen that a lot. A lot of people in the room, I'm looking around at faces that are familiar. We've been doing sports together for a long time. And it's like, get out on the court, get out on the track, pick up a ball, pick up a racket. Um, it's out there and it's available. Our folks with more complex disabilities have more challenges. So when we look at just cycling. Yeah, there's so many different pieces of, te of technology for cycling. Um, recumbent bikes, hand cycles, like mountain bikes. And so there's so many really cool pieces of technology out there that we just wanted to highlight as really important in the adaptive sports world. Um, Go ahead. You know, looking at skiing and snowboarding. I'm a skier, so that's my favorite thing that I like to do. But, you know, there's uh, pretty low tech options um, and there's high tech options of prosthetic limbs and other things like that. Looking at people with visual impairments, um, a bunch of different options for them, um, you know, with guides, without guides, um, sports specific for uh, people with visual impairments, which you'll see in this middle picture here. Um, but, you know, there's, it's really great to see all the options that have evolved over the years for people. Um, and, you know, it's, it's great. I love, I love the sports. Yeah. So our key challenge is that, you know, everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to get out there and have a good time. And I think that just some of these pictures from folks in our community and people that we've worked with over the decades um, just demonstrates their, their complexity of their situation of, you know, driving with chin control, driving with head control, driving with a joystick, um, you know, definitely ex experiencing some significant physical and, and sometimes, you know, coordination types of uh, limitations. And these folks want to get out there and be able to participate because it's something that's enjoyable and it gets us back to real life. We all like getting out there and, you know, filling the wind in your face and just 
kind of having um, a great experience with um, with looking at this. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. So I'm a good friend of ours out of Augusta, Georgia. Wayne knows who that is. You wouldn't know that this is an individual with incomplete tetraplegia in a zip line. So it's like, when I look at it, I know exactly who he is. You know, and I'm like, oh, that is so cool that he's in a zip line. But I realize, yeah, no one else knows he's paralyzed, you know, like broke his neck. But, you know, we put folks in zip lines and give. Sometimes it's that feeling of moving so fast, of having the wind whipping across your face that just makes you feel refreshed and revived and back in the game. And it's just really exciting. But when we look at the evidence of, you know, what has been published, what do we know about people with disabilities being engaged in adaptive sports and recreation? And what are the benefits of that? And if you just look at this list, I won't go through all of it, but increasing daily activity, increasing um, medical conditions like lowering HDL um, cholesterol, decreasing shoulder pain, looking at increased body mass. I, I can't ignore increased psychological well-being and improved mental health as a result of participating in sports and recreation. And we know that we've got a worldwide pandemic of issues with mental health challenges. And if we can get people, I always say, off the couch and out the door and participating in wherever they want to be in the real environment, we can really support people to have better medical condition, better mental health condition, and really have an outcome that can support them for the rest of their lives. So with that, we look at innovation, you know, and, and we're innovating in adaptive sports. We've come a long way. We've worked for decades with wheelchair basketball, you know, and, and hand cycling and wheelchair racing. And we are moving into this realm of innovation to provide um, athletes with different kinds of impairments assistive technologies that didn't exist before to participate in the activities that are most important to them or might be something new in, entirely. And we really look at this context. What I love is the context, you know, in assistive technology of maybe it's work is the context or school or the medical center or home. But I love when the context is the beach or the mountain or the court or the track or the golf course, whatever it might be, is our context of working in assistive technology. And it's all strategic. You've got to be outside of that box and Im implement our innovative thinking to support this very deserving population of people. So it's really a lot of fun. So Maddie, how do we figure this out? So it's really important to have a collaborative team to make this happen and make it effective and work for the for the athlete. You know, it takes more than just the athlete, more than just their family or caregiver, more than just the physical therapist. It takes everyone in their healthcare team, everyone in their family, their friends. What are the community adaptive sports programs? What are they looking like? What equipment do they have available? You know, it's a very interdisciplinary type of activity and, you know, red flag if there's just one person advocating for this athlete or advocating for themselves because it takes a village um, to really make it work and kind of bringing together everyone's expertise. Everyone has their thing that they know super well, but building upon all of those together can really make it an effective um, application for any kind of athlete and, you know, obviously as clinicians, any, any type of uh, patient that yeah. we see. Absolutely. And if, if you're, you know, have a lot of experience, decades of experience in this field, or just thinking about getting started, we always say, if you're trying to do it alone, that is your red flag. Because no matter how much experience any of us have, this is a complex area, and I'm always tapping into my people. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? I'm stuck. Have you had this experience before? Or none of us know what we're doing. Let's get together and talk about it and come up with a solution. At least something that's worth trying, you know, and that's the best that we can do in this, you know, realm of, of things that we're trying to solve. So key issue, wanna go ahead here, Maddie? Yeah. yeah, so key thing we wanted to highlight, just jumping off of what Kendra said, of you're not in the clinic anymore. You're not in the hospital, you're not in the outpatient clinic. You are in a closet, in a hotel room, <laughs> in snow masks, because that's what they gave you to do all of your seating evaluations. You are out in the sun and your sand is everywhere. And it's just important to highlight that you've gotta be thinking on your toes and getting out there and there's not always control in the situation but that's kind of what makes it fun uh you know we were in snow mass a couple weeks ago for the disabled veterans uh winter sports clinic and the first day was so cold you have to take your gloves off and you're like working on all the equipment and my hands are freezing but i'm like this is what makes it fun because the adrenaline rush and all of that so that's one of the things that i love you know kind of being on all different sides of the adaptive sports world, but 
That's my favorite part. Is yeah, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, I think it's a blast to be outside of the clinic. You know, to be outside, outside or in the gym, and yeah, you know, sometimes we're in a hotel room trying to do a mat eval, whatever it might be. Yoga mats work great on a conference room floor for doing mat evals, but it, it's kind of challenging. And I think um, in the conversations that I have with professionals from all different disciplines, we all agree it makes us stronger professionals to get out of the clinic and figure out what am I going to do with kind of what I can carry in my backpack, fanny pack, vest, whatever I've got going. So these are the contexts where we're often working in, in adaptive sports. Um, I think consistent with the way that we're evaluating folks for wheeled mobility and seating needs, it's really the same approach to understand that human. Okay, we're looking at that human and we really want to understand in this case, the athlete and their perspective uh, as an athlete or as a prospective um, participant in sports and recreation. And again, we don't need to go through all of these basics, but we have to understand their medical background, their diagnosis, their prognosis, their functional skills, their mental health, their social condition, who is their network because athletes need support as well. And especially if it's an athlete who's using complex technology to start with, we have to have a support um, system in place to um, help them to participate. Uh, where are they living? What are their goals is absolutely most important. So I might have a goal of you are gonna be a skier because I love skiing. And they may not have an interest in skiing. They wanna go cycling, right? So we have to think about what are their interests? Where do they live? What does their family and friends wanna be doing? Um, cycling is often the best activity when we can get folks out riding a bike because we can do that almost anywhere. So same type of approach with um, moving forward and determining what are the options for this person based on their situation, their presentation and their goals. What are our recommendations for sports participation kind of guides itself. Yeah, so looking at assistive technology specifically for sports. So definition of assistive technology, which I'm sure you all know, but we'll go over it again. Assistive technology is any item, piece of equipment, or product system, whether acquired commercially, off the shelf, modified, or customized, that is used to increase or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. So kind of looking at how this applies to sports, it's a little bit of a more specific focus. Um, looking at, you know, different environments of use, you know, we look at wheelchairs in the home community, um, medical areas, that, that kind of thing. But there's, you know, areas outside of school and work and home that we want to focus our attention on. Um, you know, it's important to facilitate social interaction and sports bring people together. That kind of team environment or that group environment are really great for people. And then at the end of the day, we're all here to optimize independence for our clients. Whatever that means for that person, whatever that person's goals are, um, we're looking at that and how technology can assist with that. And then looking at the HAT model, um, as we use with all uh, technology evaluations, looking at the human, in this case, the athlete, what activities are they doing? What sport are they doing? What sports are they interested in? What have they done? What has worked well for them? What hasn't? If they've tried different pieces of equipment, look going into the assistive technology, you know, there's so many different pieces of equipment on the market for cycles, like we said before, or wheelchair, uh, basketball wheelchairs, that kind of thing. And then looking at the context, okay, looking at what are the funding options for them? What are, what's the physical environment like? You know, what's the social environment like? Do they have access to uh, educated instructors? Kind of looking at all of that. So, you know, using that kind of clinical sort of background and focusing it on a, a sports uh, application can be, is really important. And then also looking at the hierarchy of assistive technology, you can do no tech, you can do low tech, and you can do high tech. And that's what you have available to you at that moment, what's going to work best for that individual, and kind of customizing it to each thing. So for example, swimming is no tech, right? You don't have any assistive devices, prostheses, anything like that. He's out there, he's swimming, doing his thing. Looking at low tech, we have a three track skier. He's got a normal ski, normal boot. Only difference is he has outriggers to provide additional balance and control um, when he is skiing on one limb. And then looking at high tech, we have an off road um, cycle for mountain biking or any kind of that road biking. And this is a more involved piece of equipment for this individual. So there's a there's a range of what we can do and what meets that individual and you know this person might need something for skiing and something different for cycling and something different for video games or whatever their their activities are so it's you know 
looking at that range of equipment is what we're focusing on. All right, so we want to go into some examples um, of sports that are available for people that use power wheelchairs or have complex disabilities. Some you will be familiar with and some will be new. Um, just to highlight just different examples that are available. So this is power soccer. A lot of folks have been familiar with power soccer. We have a great little clip from NBC News that really highlights the complexity of the sport. And this is just showing some practice that's, that is uh, the individual using a temporary um, foot, we call it, uh, kicking the, the large soccer ball. Uh, the complexity of the equipment is significant. This is a strike force power wheelchair um, out of Texas. And you can see that it has that really extended front end that serves as a foot. And you'll see uh, the uh, video here that comes up to show how these devices um, are used. This is a clip from NBC. I'll get it going. Good morning. At the age of two, Ben Carpenter was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy, a disease that robs people of the ability to move. When he was diagnosed, we were told he probably won't live to his next birthday. He may not breathe on his own, eat on his own. What was life like before you started playing? It was really a lot of kind of not knowing exactly what to do. But 22 years later, Ben has beaten the odds. I got you. And he believes it has something to do with the magic got of it. this sport. There wasn't really anywhere where I had fit in or where I really felt at home until power soccer came around. Power soccer is the only sport exclusively for power wheelchair users. This group of professional athletes plays got second it. in the nation. But they're also professionals off the court. Ben is a mechanical engineer. Teammate Yash Rangol is Go a software here, developer. They're just people. They just happen to use wheels instead of shoes. When you watch your son out there dominating, how do you feel? Obviously, I'm proud of him. But to see him where he is now, and even though I know through the years he has regressed, that his disease has progressed, He's still doing what he loves. Gotcha. Ben is determined to play at the 2021 World Cup in Australia. And even across the globe, the field is home. Team Carpenter comes in and scores a goal for Team USA. When we get on the court, it's, it's pedal to the metal going against each other. <laughs> stay on it, stay the on power it. wheelchair propelling him forward. I got you, I got His you. unstoppable spirit truly at the yep, wheel. Still working, or still working. Tammy Leitner, NBC News. Tampa, Florida. Hello, great. NBC News fans. Thanks great for clip. checking. A little Lester Holt for us. But I, I, that was probably about 2020. Uh, but just really a nice example. Hearing from a mom, you know, and hearing from an athlete who's a mechanical engineer who's playing power soccer at the highest level possible is just really cool um, to see what is possible um, with that sport. So Maddie gets to cover her favorite sport. She'll go into some adaptive skiing options. Yeah, so looking at adaptive skiing, kind of how it has existed for uh, several years now, we've got bi skis, we've got mono skis. Bi skis have two skis underneath. Uh, the individual often has higher levels of impairment, that varies across the board, and they are often tethered by an instructor. Mono skis are a little bit more for the independent user, um, and that's something that you would see at a highly competitive level, like in the Paralympics. Um, and so this is an example of, there, does it go? Yep, so this is an example of someone being tethered down the mountain. He is initiating turns um, with those outriggers, but looking at the amount of independence that the skier has versus the instructor. And, you know, it, it's super variable. When you're learning something, a new sport, you uh, start at a more beginner level. But, you know, when someone has different levels of impairment that affect them different ways, the progression has often been limited in the skiing world by the technology available. So this is one piece of a technology by the company, company Tetra Adapt. Jeff Rosenbluth is out of the University of Utah, and he has a couple of pieces of technology that are applied in different ways, but we'll talk about the ski first. So the Tetra ski is really cool. They modified a bi ski that was already on the market. Um, and they modified it to have power actuators. So the skis are controlled actually through a joystick. So something that you would see someone drive a power wheelchair with. Um, I had the opportunity to try it and kind of see what it works like, looks like and works on the mountain. And it's a really uh, cool piece of technology in that 
the 360 degree motion of the joystick that you have on a power chair controls the skis in a completely 360 degree way. So, you know, full straight of the joystick is French fry, if anyone out here is skiing, a skier. <laughs> and then full back is pizza. That's how you stop. And then you have the articulation of the, um, of the skis. And there's so much programming and complexities that go into it. So this is a really interesting piece of technology. It's what, five years old? It's been out about five years. Yeah, available. and they're constantly coming out with like new software drops and um, innovations that way. So this is just an example of how um, the power actuators can uh, independently move the skis. So this is a uh, simulator that someone would use kind of more in a clinics type setting to practice using the joystick. You can also operate it with a sip and puff. Um, puff is right, sip is left, and using that to operate it. So someone who doesn't have any or very little upper extremity function can do this independently on their own. So this is a simulation. They use actual terrain from a ski mountain in Utah. And this is would be used for someone who's going to practice and then go out on the mountain and do this exact terrain. So, you know, for a power wheelchair user who uses a joystick every day, this might be um, more intuitive in terms of how the, the joystick works. But if they've never been a skier, figuring out how the skis move um, and that kind of thing. So it's a it's cool, the technology that they're coming up with and, you know, this is um, this is Dr. Rosenbluth using the sip and puff in the simulator to uh, control the ski. That is so. not Jeff. That's a client. Oh, that's a client. Yeah, that's a client. It's not Dr. Rosenbluth. Rosenbluth. Yeah, looks like Jeff. Though. It does. But it, the whole idea is, um, you know, not wasting the time on the mountain, just figuring out the technology and how it works. It could be dumping snow. It could be really hot. You never know. But allowing these individuals to use a simulator to train indoors and figure out what it looks like and even to purview the terrain, the, the green or blue run they might be participating on on Saturday so that they can get out there and be ready to go. So it's just really a nice way to uh, work with that. So this is a kiddo using it. Um, he is operating the ski with a sip and puff. And, you know, they have a bunch of seating on the Tetra ski. So they've got laterals, they've got an eye to eye with facial laterals, like they can get someone set up and locked in there and ready to go so that you know from the seating and positioning aspect which we'll talk more about later get them dialed in so they're focused on the skiing not the staying upright or i'm sliding out or i'm not i don't fit in this mm -hmm. so it's a really cool option for you know high level quads or someone with cp or just who has that more of that impairment to like get out there and be independent on the mountain so I did get to try this a couple weeks ago. I had an injury in December skiing, and so I thought I didn't get to ski the rest of the season, but I did get to go out and it was really cool. So I kind of went into it um, as a learning, uh, kind of asking all of these questions and seeing what it looked like. So this is me in it. I am operating it with a joystick with my right hand and they have different uh, 3D printed joysticks. So they can kind of make anything that someone would use on their power chair. They have the goalpost, the long one, they have all of these options, and then they can make anything through this, this Tetra Adapt. Um, and so I have in the left picture, I've got the eye to eye and the facial laterals, and they locked me in there. And I tried to emulate what it would be like to be a brand new Tetra ski user, because I am a brand new Tetra ski user. So this does go on the lift and we'll show you a video in just a minute, but you know anywhere that you would take a normal by ski, you can take this it does really great in the in the powder we had like probably six inches of fresh snow and snow mass when I got to try it so I was like yes get to ski powder one more time this season and. Um, it's just it's a really cool piece of technology, this is how the ski would be loaded onto the lift. So if you can imagine the chairlift comes around the bend and this is lifted up, you can do it with one instructor. So kind of how this works is the uh, skier can control everything through the joystick or the sip and puff, whatever the mode is. And then there is an instructor. They are tethered for safety, but they're not lowering the athlete down the mountain. The athlete has completely independent 
movement of the ski and their body in space. The instructor does have a remote that they can override because, you know, I would just, I was doing a sip and puff and I would sip instead of puff because I don't use that every day and then I would go this wrong <laughs> direction and they can override it so it's a very safe application, but it means that someone can do this independently that someone can get out on a mountain and go where they want to go not to be bucketed down or lowered down the mountain via tethers. Um, so this was really great the uh, seeing we saw what 13 veterans. Um, at the event get to use this and it was amazing. One of my favorite uh, moments is we had worked on this, uh, we did an evaluation for this gentleman kind of later stage MS and had a pretty kyphotic posture and a lateral head lean and you know he had been a bi -ski user forever and he was like I really, really want to try this. So we got him out on two lessons. He was out there like ripping around the mountain. This <laughs> other guy, the instructors were complaining that we turned him into a powder hound because he kept wanting to go in the powder, but like he could do that because he had the liberty to do that. And so when this gentleman came back, uh, he said to us, he says, you know what? It makes me feel like a human again, that I can take myself down the mountain and go where I want to go instead of being... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, under the control of someone else so it's just it's just really cool to hear that like in practice to see from the beginning of the week to the end of the week that this guy got to go out and do it and he loved it and he might not get uh as many opportunities for independence in his daily life but this gave him the option to do that and he's like well so when can i do it again I'm like okay we got to figure that out there's a lot of logistics with it but it's just it's a cool application for for someone with you know who doesn't have those opportunities maybe in other uh, sports or outlets. So this is someone driving the ski with a joystick. And you'll see the instructor behind them is just there as a, a safety backup, not the primary. Uh, Someone feels like a mid wheel drive power chair mm -hmm. feels a little bit like a mid wheel drive power chair, but you have the angulation of the skis at the same mm -hmm. time. So like Maddie was saying, you know, straight for faster wedging for slowing down turn right turn left and come to a complete hockey stop. It's and really what's nice. really cool is they've incorporated a lot of uh, similar concepts in terms of electronics and programming that you would see in a power wheelchair so there's so many different uh, like a uh, speed in which it turns so you know there's. The beginning middle and i'm sorry beginners and then more advanced programming levels so they've got that track for the brand new tetra ski user and then someone who's been using it a lot and one thing i wanted to note that i think is interesting kind of just in the sports world in general is you know brand new athletes versus um people who are more experienced I'm not a power wheelchair user, but I do know how to use a joystick and a power chair because I work as a supplier and do that every day. So that part was challenging, but I'm a skier, so I know how my skis are supposed to go on the mountain, how my skis are supposed to navigate the terrain and the snow and the bumps. And so it was interesting to kind of combine those two and seeing how someone who might have been a skier before their injury or someone who has never skied before, kind of like what that learning curve would look like. So I think it's a cool application. Um, highly recommend if you guys see it in any of your local adaptive programs, um, they are out there and is a, is a great option. So in this sense, this is a super high tech option. Yep. Who thought she could chat so much? Wow. Awesome. So we just wanted to share briefly the, the same technology developed out of the University of Utah that we've had the opportunity to play with a bit has been applied to sailing, adaptive sailing. So if you take that Tetra Adapt technology and, and have, they have implemented into the um, catamaran sailboat type applications and are able to take, again, very complex individuals. This individual is on a ventilator and managing the sail and his um, turning with a sip and puff system. This is a, uh, if you look closely at the rudder at the back of the boat, this is one of the engineers demonstrating how the sip and puff used to control the rudder that steers the sailboat um, out on open water. So you can see that if you look closely at the far right side of that, how he is using sip and puff to control the boat. This particular boat is the um, Hobie Mirage Island. You'll see this video. Now you gotta watch this video, it's pretty incredible. This is the Hobie Mirage Island. This is at a reservoir outside of Salt Lake City. 
and we'll kind of pan around. This is a, a professionally done video. So you have pontoons out on the side. That gentleman is a respiratory therapist because the individual that is manning the sails and steering um, high level C3 tetraplegia on a ventilator. And we think it's pretty cool that, you know, you bring, get everybody out there as a member of the team. And when your respiratory therapists are saying, I'll go, you know, and manage the ventilator, make sure that there's no issues. They haven't had any issues with it yet. Or uh, Dr. Jeff is a physiatrist and he'll go out there and, you know, be the one to manage respiratory function or anything else just in case. Um, really pretty cool what we can do with some folks with um, complex impairments. And again, check out their website. That's Jeff there on the left and um, see what they're doing out in Utah. And, and they've traversed it across the country. So for example, we don't have a Tetra ski at every resort in Colorado, but we have a representative in Colorado that can um, travel to support those complex, those people with complex impairments um, where they want to ski. So if they want to go to Winter Park, great. Let's meet there on the 15th and get all of that worked out. So it's becoming more inclusive um, with individuals that are participating there. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I put it up there. Uh, search Tetra Adapt. Tetra Adapt, University of Utah. Absolutely. So kind of shifting gears into some other sports applications, Bacha is like the latest craze. It's so competitive. If you've ever been to like a, an official Bacha competition, <laughs> adaptive Bacha, it's really intense. So it's really cool the different technologies that are available. Um, you kind of have kind of more of a simple ramp. So if someone maybe doesn't have function for uh, tossing the ball, I don't know if tossing is the official. Is it tossing? I'm not throwing. It's bocce. You know, like you guys do bocce in your backyard, yeah. but it's bocce adaptive. So we yeah. call it bocce. Don't call it bocce. It's bocce. Mm -hmm. Is it tossing? Do we toss it? I think so. Whatever the terminology is, it's very. You throw cool. a stone. You throw a yep. stone and curling, but yeah. So go. this is an example of a more complex setup for a bacha system. So he has a, an attachment to his head and he uses that stick to then drop the ball down the ramp. He has a helper who he instructs to uh, move the ramp as needed to um, like steer it, I guess you, if you would say, um, and she doesn't see the, the court at all. So someone who has a high level of impairment is independent and you know, there are people going to the Paralympics for this and our world class athletes. And I just think that is so cool. You gotta watch closely. Here it is. It's kind of a slow motion activity. He's wearing a helmet with a, a stick on the tip of his helmet. He can direct the helper where to place the ramp and where to place the ball. Mm -hmm. And then he tapped the ball with his helmet and is directing where, with the amount of force, how far that ball is going to go onto the court. And we'll show an example of that. Go ahead and click on that one. This is a nice little tutorial. Boccia is a Paralympic sport and is a game of strategy and skill. But how is it played? Two sides compete against each other as individuals, a pair, or as a team of three. One side has six red balls. The other has six blue balls. One side plays the jack onto the court and then plays their first ball. The aim of the game is to get your balls closer to the white jack ball than your opponent. The side, whose ball is not nearest to the jack, throws until they get a ball closer or until they run out of balls. It is permitted to hit the jack, your own balls or your opponent's balls. Once all the balls have been played, one side receives a point for every ball they have nearer to the jack than their opponent's closest ball. Individual and pairs play four ends. Team matches have six ends. At Paralympic level, players are divided into four classifications, dependent on their impairment and functional ability. Boccia continues to grow internationally and provide opportunities for athletes with severe and complex impairments to compete at an elite level on the world stage. So cool. We love Boccia because for in its initial years, it was dominated by individuals with cerebral injuries, cerebral palsy, others with anoxic types of brain injuries and folks picked up on it and and then we went at the national veterans wheelchair games we opened it up to our folks who use power wheelchairs trying to provide more opportunities for them and now all the paras in their ultralight wheelchairs are like we want to play bacha so we have like 400 people during the week playing bacha because everyone wants to be part of it yeah so these are some examples of some high-tech bacha ramps there's the website there for kind of that really uh, involved athlete bacha athlete very customizable. All right, moving into archery, we have uh, more examples of things that can be done for archery. This is an individual T6 para 
um, you know, in his everyday chair with custom seatings. I think he's got a ride custom seat in there to just get him, lock him in for stability, right? And then that allows someone with T6 paraplegia to sit, you know, unsupported and um, aim at the target. This is, um, you know, we're not supposed to have favorites, but one of my favorite veterans um, was injured with, a, with an, an aneurysm and has obvious right dense hemiplegia. And um, he was well, he was probably 15, 20 years post injury and well into his 40s when he discovered the sport of archery. And if you look at him closely, obviously we've stabilized his um, arm that he does not have control of. He typically drives a power wheelchair with a joystick, but competes from his manual wheelchair. And he's using a mouth tab, okay? So not necessarily super high tech, but he's using a mouth tab to extend and then is releasing with his teeth. We have to have conversations with his dentist from time to time. But this is um, you know, a way that individuals with one arm um, can compete. There's a high level uh, American athlete that has triple amputations and competes with um, one leg and his mouth. Um, one leg and mouth does it phenomenal on the stage. But what was really cool is um, this gentleman uh, around mid 40s, 20 years post injury, um, competed at the 2012 Paralympics in London, which was quite an achievement um, for this level of impairment. Just really wonderful person. These are some adaptations that um, have been accomplished by our amazing colleagues. In the VA, if you watch this individual, he also has um, dense hemiplegia, obviously, on the right side. He is not using a mouth tab. I know it's a little bit hard to see it, and we'll show it a little bit closer. Look at the stamina that it takes. He is holding that. This is an active video the whole time you're watching it, and then releases that. And this is just, again, some innovation um, for his um, right hemiplegia. So there's a custom-made fabricated shield on his left shoulder, with our, which our orthotists um, assisted in fabricating. They have a pulley system, and he's just using a carabiner with his right thumb where he has enough control to pull the carabiner to release the arrow. And again, just examples of creative thinking. Uh, people are coming up with ways to do um, activities that were not possible for people with these severe impairments before. Also looking at shooting, we've got an air rifle application. So he is engaging the trigger of the air rifle using a sip and puff system. This is at the wheelchair games. And, you know, for a lot of people, that's the better picture if you can see it. So show the stand as well. Yep. And then the uh, air rifle is being held up by a stand. There's a couple different stands that people use based on what their needs are. Also looking at outdoor recreation, people love to get out there and you know do the activities that make them really happy. And this gentleman can go out and um, hunt as he, you know, as his as his hobby. And there are options for that. They have uh, mounts that can go onto a, the front of the power wheelchair for the rifles and other uh, guns, and um, also sip and puff and other uh, trigger engagements. Yeah, the company that does a great job with adaptive shooting is um, Be Adaptive for the assistive technology. So they have sip and puff systems, different types of access. They also have options for reduced force trigger. Mm -hmm. So if an individual only has, you know, minimal flexion or reduced strength in their hand, we can reduce the force that's required to pull the trigger and that individual can then shoot. And then like Maddie said, the stands, typically the position would be prone which is prone on elbows. And so if an individual cannot stabilize the gun or has a resting tremor or something going on, we will provide them a stand. And they can also have a helper um, to assist with loading um, anything that they need to do. These are air rifles um, in, our, in this case. So oh, this is a fun one. Uh, so climbing, look at this individual. Uh, he um, has a, a limb Left discrepancy. Left upper quarter, including mm -hmm. the shoulder blade. And this is one of my favorite stories. So this little guy was probably six when we met him. He was at a local adaptive program in Denver, Adaptive Adventures. They kind of go all over, all over the US and he wanted to climb. So this is Craig, one of a, he's a phenomenal climber, um, amputee. And this kiddo has, is, has three um, amputations kind of close after birth. And so he uses his power chair and this is him using some of the technology to climb the wall on his own. He went up that thing probably, <laughs> what, three times. He le levered himself up the whole time. And we like this picture. So these are his siblings on the climbing wall with him. So he can get up there with his family. I mean, 
all the kids love to hang out with the siblings and have competitions. And so it's just really cool to see that, that, you know, this six year old can be out there and doing it on his own. He's obviously belayed. Um, and this is his family. It was just a fun summer activity where everyone could, could participate. They also did water skiing and cycling and some other things. So What's so cool about this camp, Adaptive Adventures runs this camp every summer that we call it Stars of Tomorrow. And you have, it's like 12 and under, and then the whole family's invited, but the kiddo gets to go first. So they, we do kayaking and rock climbing and water skiing and cycling. And so water skiing is, you know, the, the kiddo with the disability first, and then all the other kids have to wait their turn, but it's just a blast. And this mom was like, I love, you know, we get out here and they do a lot of things together. Really neat. What a cute little kiddo. He had a wonderful family. All right, wheelchair curling, just a quick example of just, you know, challenging each other and in innovation. Um, wheelchair curling, another uh, big fad of, of things that we're seeing with some images of what it looks like. There's a, it's a, you throw the stone, and when you're using your wheelchair, it, you're not holding onto the stone, but you're using a stick to throw the stone. And so this is what it looks like from a manual wheelchair. This is one of our veterans competing at the 2010 Paralympics in Vancouver gives you an example. So they have an individual that stabilizes them from behind. They're in typically their everyday wheelchair, and then they're throwing the stone down to that target. And so great colleague of ours, I have many colleagues here from the Seattle VA, said, what are we going to do for our power wheelchair users? And um, rec therapist Vance Pease came up with a prototype device to allow an individual with a power wheelchair to throw the stone. So first created it out of PVC and then built it out of a stainless steel and they're using it at the local um, ice arena to throw the stone while using a power wheelchair. So you can see there's a lot of strategy involved with how fast you're gonna move. I'll let you guys see that one one more time. People are kind of looking. Um, how fast are you going to be moving your chair? When are you gonna stop? And then it's the same type of application where you have um, your uh, teammates sweeping the ice to keep that stone moving in just the right direction. So. Um, at the Academy of Spinal Cord Injury Professionals Group, ASKIP, we have an annual competition of innovation. We have a low-tech device and a high-tech device competition of like, submit your stuff, and then they have to do like a Shark Tank presentation, and then we vote throughout the week, and, and Vance won the Innovation Award um, that year for doing this kind of stuff. With all-terrain power wheelchairs, um, we could talk for hours on all-terrain power wheelchairs. There's a whole bunch of different options available. I saw a few of them in the exhibit hall really neat to see the different designs, um, whether it's just traversing across all terrain or getting over significant obstacles. This one is the action track chair. Um, and you can get an example of, you know, being submerged in water. This is a rushing river. Um, what these devices are capable of doing over on the right, your conference director, Mark Schmaler, is doing a little test drive. It, power standing function. And again, the folks often designing these devices are not healthcare and rehabilitation professionals. So the standing function, maybe you're thinking, oh, it's for increased bone density. Oh, it's for pressure management. No, it's for shooting or it's for casting a fly rod, whatever it might be, but it works well for those applications as well. Without getting onto my soapbox, I would just say a power wheelchair is a power wheelchair and therefore it should be test tested to the appropriate international and national standards to be determined to be safe, reliable and perform as intended in these kinds of environments. Because I tell you, if you're gonna be out in mud slush you know, bank out at the beach where the surf's coming in, you want to make sure that those batteries are going to perform as intended and that everything's going to be able to get that folk, that uh, person back to where they started. Um, seating for sports, again, it's not the topic of today's conversation, but I couldn't leave it out. Uh, we could talk a lot about seating for sports, but these are some of the reasons that we are addressing seating for sports. None of them are surprising. It's the same as seating for everyday um, activities, but we're looking at postural stability for dynamic movement so the individual can participate. Skin protection always. Skin always wins. We don't want to put anyone in a situation where we would provide a, a skin compromise risk because that would just take them out of the game entirely and probably take them out of real life for a bit as well. So we're looking for some applications to um, to protect skin at all times, prevent injuries. You know, if we can get people stable and solid and 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 really performing well, they're less likely to fall or they're less likely to suffer a major injury when they fall. So it's a real problem if you push a manual wheelchair or drive whatever you're doing when you fracture a clavicle is problematic for individuals who use wheelchairs. So again, without a lot of different examples, just highlighting seating in action. 
One of my favorites is on the left. Um, again, at our uh, Veterans Winter Sports Clinic, we kind of are willing to push the envelope and put our high tetraplegic folks on snowmobiles. And so we've come up with some adaptations to um, provide appropriate back support. And I'll tell you, body point ankle huggers installed on a snowmobile work fabulous for keeping paralyzed limbs on a snowmobile. Okay, and we also use go-kart harnesses. If you think about um, go-karts moving fast across a track and they're turning in figure eights, we're on snowmobiles moving fast. So we're using go-kart grade harnesses um, to sustain the G-forces as we're going around curves. And, you know, it wasn't my idea to put <laughs> paralyzed people on snowmobiles, but if we're gonna do it, we're gonna keep them safe. Really kind of cool. And just some different applications of where we're uh, doing seating in action. The, the photo in the center is a lot of fun where, um, Individuals, um, we found great value in using the foot pedaled recumbent cycles for individuals that have leg function um, enough to pedal with their feet, but they may not have balance and coordination um, to remain on an upright bike safely. And so we've done some applications looking at some partners out there of um, we can, for someone with um, hemiplegia, for example, we can put all of the controls on one side. So all of the shifting, all of the braking with the right hand, both legs pedaling, and then the left hand can be you know, for the ride along. It works out really nice and we're doing some great applications out there. This is one of my favorite, um, you know, seating examples is, you know, with good seating and adaptive sports, um, you, you, we minimize the impact of a disability. So one of these two people has a severe polytraumatic injury um, and we get them seated just right and put smiles on faces and out there having a blast. We don't have to look out there on the water and say, there's a disabled person participating in sports, but rather there's a couple of people having a really great time. Isn't that neat? So just really a lot of fun. Um, shout out to Creating Ability um, out of Minnesota with Kevin Carr and team for just creating some amazing opportunities for kayaks and canoes and other water sports to provide um, pelvic trunk um, seating supports, offloading bony prominences and looking at some examples of how we can do that. Maddie's going to share a fun little case study here. Yeah, so um, skiing was kind of a big topic for this this presentation. So we wanted to do a, a little case study on Brent King. He was at the Seattle VA like this is 80 a, million years Seattle ago. VA I've known folks. him my Come whole life. <laughs> and whole so he, what, T10? 12. T12 yeah. para and through series of unfortunate events, um, bilateral hip disarticulation. You'll see he's a jokester. Those are turkey legs, I believe. Um, <laughs> on the, he's on his ride custom yes. cushion with little turkey legs sitting on the front. That's how he is. We know this. Yeah. So due to his kind of complex sitting posture, he does have ride custom seating. He was a skier for a very long time, um, an independent, amazing mono skier. And then through all of these kind of health challenges, he got a custom seating system for his mono ski. So this uh, ride designs uh, Aspen seating is based out of Denver and they do a lot of different pieces of equipment. And so they dialed in. He also has kind of a, I don't know if it's a go-kart, but it's a harness to kind of keep him locked in there. You know, if you think about it, if you're in your ski boot, you don't want to be swimming around. You're in there, you're locked in. His butt is locked in to that seating system. And there's music coming, just so you know. This is Brent skiing on his own. He goes out with his son all the time. And, you know. So T12 paraplegia minus both hips at the pelvis. We use a pelvis and a socket with some harnesses. We like to call it a butt boot. I have heard it called an asthotic <laughs> or a butt boot. But, you know, again, just getting the right seating in place. We can talk a lot. Group from um, you guys, Aspen Seating Ride Designs is here and um, doing a lot with uh, custom seating. Uh, in the last Paralympics, I think we served athlete. We served athletes um, from like 10 or 12 different countries who are using custom seating in their rigs as a result of great work being done with our by our colleagues. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And we'll touch on this quickly. Another sports application for power wheelchair users at the National Veterans Wheelchair Games, we do power slalom obstacle course. So uh, this veteran is operating it with a head array and associated switches. And so she is out there. Here's another uh, veteran, but just another way for people to get out there and get involved in whatever it is they want to get involved in. The energy is there. So what's, what's fun, I have some colleagues in the room that we've been involved with our uh, National Veterans Wheelchair Games for many years together. And 
it was always a manual wheelchair event. So we create these hardcore uh, manual wheelchair obstacle courses and, and folks that are full-time wheelchair users are out there. I mean, they're jumping stuff. They're going through sand pits and gravel pits and all of this. And many, uh, several years later, um, we just said, you know what? We've got our power wheelchair users who are professional drivers you know, with their head, with their chin, whatever they're doing. And we created classes of events and appropriate hardcore power wheelchair obstacle courses for these individuals to compete against each other. So it's just really been a lot of fun to be part of that. So, you know, our question is, are you up for this challenge, right? So all of you are here because you love wheeled mobility and seating. You love assistive technology. Um, we want you to challenge yourself to open up your ideas. Um, get out there. Get out there. You want to share some, who some of these people are? Good. Yeah, so these are some of our veteran athletes. I'm, I'm there on the left. And then some of our team members, clinicians, other professionals who are getting out there, learning the technology, you know, the best way that you can teach it and expand awareness is to know how to do it yourself. And so whenever you have the opportunity to use any sort of adaptive equipment, whatever that might be, we highly encourage getting it out there. And, you know, it's, wonderful for a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons so yeah we just love the this the example of these are these are our colleagues out there trying different stuff and it's the only way you can learn it i guarantee you you cannot learn this stuff in your clinic at your desk online you got to get out there and do it find out what's going on your in your community and start there i have you show up and say i have special skills let me help this population with your hand cycling clinic and you will soon be welcomed back the following saturday um, I want you to challenge your perception of athletes. So your next client with complex seating needs, needing a new wheelchair, whatever that might be, may have aspirations or may be, you know, a high level competitive athlete. This is Paul Callahan, who we met in 2005, who had been on bed rest for two years with complex seating issues. And um, we got him up and about in his everyday chair to start with custom seating in a sailboat and went on to compete in 2012 in London. Just amazing um, with C6 tetraplegia. Um, be an advocate, right? You know who these people are. You know what their ambitions are. You know how motivated they are. I mean, just to live this life with the technology that they are able to incorporate in their everyday life is amazing. And to be thinking outside of the box about what some of the opportunities might be for what their skills are. You, you might ask them. They might come up with something you've never even heard of before. And it's like, let's think about how we can adapt that sport um, for you. Resources, there's a whole bunch of stuff out there. Um, I'll make sure that you guys have access to a PDF of the slides. Um, International Paralympic Committee, love the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, no longer U.S. Olympics and U.S. Paralympics, but together. Um, national governing bodies for each sport. So I classify for USA Cycling. So when you go to USA Cycling, then you see all the, uh, the options for adaptive, whether it's visual impairment, physical impairment, whatever it might be. Um, disability organizations, ALS Foundation, Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, um, blind veterans of America, different types of organizations will then highlight opportunities available for your populations. And again, getting online and surfing what's out there for your sport of choice, um, you'll find a lot of options and a lot of assistive technologies that are out there. So shout out to some amazing colleagues. Um, we don't do this by ourselves. I got Dawn out there in this picture. Our whole team is here from our uh, event two weeks ago and uh, we just learn from each other. You know, we all show up and go, I don't know. What do you think we should do? And we all work together and figure things out and um, feel really blessed to be part, you know, be uh, able to participate and contribute to this very deserving area. So a lot of fun. I hope you guys um, will, you know, leave with some great ideas and support your folks. And believe it or not, mark the calendar. We do have time for a couple questions. You're welcome. There you go. <laughs> all right. Maddie's coming around. Come on, you guys got good questions or comments and ideas? There we go. Hold on one moment so we can capture you on. There you go. At my clinic, we try to do community events where, where we find an organization or a group that is adapting an event that they already special or an activity that they already specialize okay. in. So for instance, we have archery this month. Oh, great, great. So we have a place that does archery for kids through adults and they started an adaptive program. One of our biggest obstacles is always power mobility yeah. users and there's a lot of good technology out there. Even more so than that is ventilator dependent yes. individuals. Yes. So 
I have a few at the clinic that are interested in participating in things, but our options with what's out there already is limited. And she, one of my patients is very interested in water-based sports. So can yeah. we get in the water? Yeah. Do you have a good resource for um, protecting the ventilator with water exposure yeah. and suggestions for yeah. that? I, I will not pretend to be a subject matter expert on protecting ventilators from water, but I would tap into your respiratory therapists who are the experts on the technology and invite them to come along. You know, as you saw, invite them to be part of it. Um, talk with the manufacturers as well. So, you know, if, if you're taking someone out onto a boat or something, you can always tap into the manufacturers. Do you have suggestions for water tidying? They won't be thrilled to hear from you, but if you say we're gonna do this anyway, um, they might provide some suggestions for doing that. And if you get stuck, I mean, honestly, not a subject matter expert, but that University of Utah group is doing some great stuff with water. And so I'm always happy to defer to those who have figured this out and, and we're happy to connect, connect folks. Great. That's a tough question, right? Ventilators and sports and water. I've actually seen someone scuba dive with yeah. a ventilator and I yeah. teach adaptive yeah, scuba. There you go. So it's really cool, but who does yeah. it and right. provides the equipment? Yeah. Tough, these are tough problems to solve, but they're good problems to solve, right? Like, how do we take a person with a ventilator out in the water? Anyone else? Yeah. Um, you know, obviously this stuff is the, you know, front cover of the magazine type of stuff, but like, there are other patients who like, want to get back to playing music or yeah, like absolutely. art or there are other like recreational hobbies. What type of things are you seeing that are, are good for those like still indoor activities, but are still very important to, to our patients? Yeah, I mean, I don't work in that area as much with the creative arts. Absolutely phenomenal. I see some of my rec therapy colleagues here. Nicole, any suggestions? I always defer to my experts. Any suggestions? Nicole is out of the Cleveland VA. Look at that, deferring the answer, putting her on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Use the mic. Grab the mic, Maddie. Um, video games. Uh, yeah. Or someone can use a sip and puff. They have a joystick, like a quad mouse joystick, I think is what it's called. So that could be an application. Not everyone does sports, right? We know that. And there are applications out there and new innovations as well. All right, we'll go back here and then we'll go to the back corner. Then we'll clear the room or I'll get in trouble for talking too much. Yeah, so as it comes, it has a very wide base of stability. I asked that question, I said, can this thing tip over? And I think they said the only situation is when you're on a cat track and there's a, a large grade change, but it was a very slow movement. And so in typical skiing down a mountain, it does not tip over. It's much wider base of support than a typical bi ski. So. As of right now, they have joystick and sip and puff. I know that they are looking into other switch options, um, working on the technology for that, and then access as you're bumping down the mountain. But I know that that's something they're working on, which is also a great option. But for now, just joystick and sip and puff. All right, last question back in the back, and then we'll clear out and answer questions in the hallway. I was gonna give an answer and not a question. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, the person who asked about some other act opportunities for some of those folks who use power mobility, I think two um, recreation opportunities that were not discussed were things like bowling as well as billiards. Those are so, there are some low tech options to give a lot of access to a lot of different people. Um, and I, I think these are things that are easily found within a community and allow people to play with the family, with their friends, and doesn't have all the cost of travel. Mm -hmm. So I think look at what they like to do and what's available before you have to go uh, um, way out there and really look at the cost of equipment. Yep. 
And who doesn't love to bowl? I thought I was a good bowler when I was teaching my kids how to bowl. And then they got good enough that we had to bring those little ramps down, those little bumpers on the side. And I am not a good bowler. So um, we will, we're going to clear out of here because we have a 245 session. We'll step out into the back hallway if you have more questions. Um, thank you so much for coming. And I think my co-presenter knocked it out of the park. What do you guys think?